Welcome to the Fall 2023 rendition of Math 121, Section 1. My name is Larry Bowen, and let's just jump right in. Remember, you can pause, rewind, go back at any point, and go through this video again. It's very important that you understand how this course works. I just can't overemphasize how important it is to get off to a good start in this course. I think more so than any other subject matter, math is that way. Please take it seriously and get off to a good start this semester. Here's the information you'll need. You'll find it in the syllabus. You'll find it here. You'll find it on the PowerPoint and Blackboard to contact me. The best contact outside of class is lbowen at ua.edu, which is my email address. I check email very frequently, and I expect you to do the same. That's our primary way of communicating with each other. And if you email me about something, I will get back to you relatively quickly on that, probably more quickly than you assume I will. This course assumes that you're an adult in control of your own life, and that you can plan, coordinate, schedule, take responsibility, and do things in your own self-interest. There is so much assistance for this course, and it's free, and you don't need an appointment to get it. Other than being in class with me, you can get help through the Math, Learn Math Technology Learning Center, the MTLC, and you can check through Blackboard in case anything changes during the semester, but as of today, Monday through Friday from noon until 5 p.m., except the days that are being tested in the MTLC, which right now are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You can use these services, drop in, no appointment necessary to get assistance. You can be in the room with other students taking the same course, helping each other, having people who know the material, wandering around, you can ask them to help. There's all sorts of assistance there. Notice that goes to 5 p.m. We also coordinate with the Capstone Center for Student Success, CCSS. They do tutoring in a wide range of subject matters, but for us, Math 121 is of major interest. They do so much with mathematics courses, they actually use our facilities in the evenings. So, in coordination with CCSS from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday and this happens even through test week you can come in to 2000 MSB to get assistance. MSB is the math science building that's the building where you'll be taking all your tests and which I hope you'll be using for a resource as you go through this course for assistance. Those two things cover from noon until 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And that is a lot of hours where you can just wander in, do your homework in there, have specific questions you can ask. You can come in with a friend or you can make friends in there that are taking the same course and you can work together. It's a nice, quiet space that you can use to your benefit if you're willing to do that. I will be in there personally, my office hours in that MSB 2000, every Wednesday from 3.30 to 5 p.m. If you want to see me in particular, I will say that this course should allow time at the end of most, not all, but most of our regular class lectures for you to get out your laptop and sit and do problems after I've finished the lecture part of the class. Not every class, but most. 
it's the perfect time for you to get started while what I've said is still fresh in your mind. And as I'm walking around the room answering questions, you have a great shot at getting me one-on-one. -on -one. What better opportunity? So at the end of most of my lectures, there will be some time left, and I would suggest bringing your laptop and staying until 9.15 and getting a head start on your homework and getting easy access to me. Now, we'll say the Capstone Center for Student Success does tutor other things besides math, so I would go to their website. If you've got this PowerPoint up, you can click the link, but I think the web address is success.ua.edu, and look at what else they do. You may have some other courses where they can be of assistance to you. You are automatically registered into this course for the software and everything you need for this course unless you opt out. There are very few reasons why you would, but if you think you might, I would suggest that you talk to me before you do that because uh, most people have no reason to opt out. And that opting out is has to do with having the software available. If you do opt out for some reason, that means you have to arrange to purchase the software on your own. The software is called WebAssign and you will use that to do all your homework assignments and to take your test. So you'll spend a lot of time in WebAssign. And the way you get there, you can go into Blackboard through MyBama, or you can type in ualearn.blackboard.com and go to Blackboard straight through there. And you might want to do it that way if you want to put a, something in your favorites on your browser and don't want to bring up MyBama first, or maybe MyBama is down for a few minutes and you need to go straight there. But in any case, you can go to Blackboard through MyBama or through this direct link, ualearn.blackboard.com. Once you get there, you'll see your Blackboard, which has a lot of information, and you need to spend some time on that and seeing exactly what information is in Blackboard. But assuming you want to get into WebAssign, there is a link on the left panel and also in the main body in Blackboard that says Access WebAssign. If you click that link, it will take you into WebAssign where you do all your homework and you'll be taking your test. Testing has to be done in the MTLC in 2000 MSB, but your homework can be done anywhere and although I suggest you use the services in the MTLC to work, you can actually do your homework anywhere that you have a computer and internet access. Not testing, but homework. At the end of every semester, I have students always come up to me and say, is there anything I can do for extra credit to boost my grade a little bit? And the answer is no. However, there is something you can do continuously throughout the semester that will boost your grade, and that is to keep ahead of the deadlines for your homework assignments. If you work ahead and finish any part of your homework at least 24 hours before the deadline, you'll get a 10% bonus for that part. Even if you only did three questions in a homework assignment 24 hours or more early, you'll get 10% bonus for those three questions. Of course, ideally, you want to do the entire homework set before the 24-hour deadline for bonus points expires, and you'll get 10% for the entire assignment. Now, that adds up. If you go all semester and get 10% the entire semester for every homework assignment, that's like adding two extra points onto your final course grade, and that could be the difference between a B plus and an A minus, or it could be the difference between not passing and passing. Keep in mind, this course is an NC course. You can't actually get a D or F in this course, but if you make below a C minus, which is 70%, you get something called an NC, which means no credit. And if you're in the business school, of course, you have to have a C minus or higher for the course to get credit. If you get an NC, it does not affect your GPA. However, it does mean that as long as you stay in business and need this course, you have to take it again. Don't wait until you've sunk yourself before you get, get help. Get it right away. It's always available. It's up to you, though, to be proactive and get that help right away 
not, into, not after it's already hurt you. You can't use computer or internet issues to get any changes in your homework deadlines. You're expected to stay ahead of it enough. If you start the assignment an hour before the deadline and something happens to your computer or the internet access, you cannot say, okay, I, I need the extra time. You cannot get it. It will not be extended. So just be sure to get your homework assignment done in plenty of time. And as I said earlier, you really want to get the bonus points anyway, which means you want to get it done at least 24 hours early. And it's a good idea, even if the bonus points weren't there. It's a good idea to log out a web assignment when you start working on it. And anytime you see a save button or submit button, you can use that before you log out. If you submit a homework assignment before the due date, you can still come back to it. If you didn't, if you missed something, you want to go back and correct it. Up until the deadline, you can keep doing that. And ideally, you will have a hundred percent on every homework assignment and if they're done early enough you'll end up with 110 percent on every homework assignment and that's a lot think about that now because you can't go back and do it once you get into october november december you've already lost those points from from late august and, and september you can't go back and get them i really want you to be in class i know this is an 8 a.m class but you signed up for it and you need to make sure you can be here if you can't, until drop ads over, you can keep an eye and see if there's any openings and move into a class that's not 8 a.m. because we have looked at this and can see that coming to class really affects grades. For instance, the average course grade for students attending class more than half the time was a B. Not bad. The average course grade for students that attended less than half the time was a failing grade. That is bad. The average attendance for those who didn't pass last semester, for instance, was 15%. So if you didn't pass, chances are you hardly attended class. There is a correlation. Take that for what it's worth. But in my opinion, you're going to do much better in this course if you put your body in here, attend the lectures, and then stay at the end and get your homework at least started. If you don't want to do that, you're an adult, that's totally up to you. But I promise you, for the vast majority of people, it can make a huge difference. The grades are very simple. 20% of your grade comes from homework, 80% from tests. If you go into WebAssign, you can see when every homework assignment is due. If you count back 24 hours and try to get it done before then, you can get the bonus 10%. If you only get half of it done, you'll still get the bonus on the half you did early. Idea is to get it all and end the semester with 110% on every one of your homeworks. That would be absolutely wonderful. You can try the question over and over again. You don't have to get it right on the first try. There's no penalty for missing something and correcting it later. There's a lot of help information. As I page through this, I'm going to pop up some of the web assign screens, I'm not going to spend much time going over them because I want you to go into web assign and click all these links and look at it in there. But I will pop up a few pages of what web assign looks like just to give you a preview. But before I leave this, I want to say one more time how important that extra bonus points for doing something early can be. Think really hard before you just blow off the opportunity to get those points. I told you I'd show some examples of some of the pages within WebAssign. If this is something you'll see within WebAssign, there's a like a read it button which can let you read some help information. There's a watch it which brings up a little video that would give you a video that might help you solve a problem you're having trouble with. There's an ask your teacher link that you can click and it'll send that particular problem to to me and you can ask a question about that particular problem now it's not instantaneous but i will see it fairly quickly because i check my email very very often 20 percent homework 80 percent test now there are five tests the last test you can call it the final if you want to it's comprehensive but it is droppable the best four of your five tests count so if the first four test scores you have are really, really good, it might be the case that your comprehensive exam at the end is your droppable. 
which effectively means you wouldn't have to take that at, at, during final exam week. That's a really strong incentive to do well on test one, two, three, and four, because if you do that, test five disappears. Think about that as well. But if you do have one poor test grade, it can be your drop. You take test five, comprehensive, replace that low test grade, and your grade still is okay. It still is okay. So we give you a lot of opportunities to help yourself, but you have to play it smart. You can't go back in November and fix the lack of doing things that you should have done from August, September, and October. You have to do it as the time comes for doing those kind of things. All testing will be done in the math science building, homework anywhere, although you can work in the math science building, but the testing has to be done there. We'll talk a lot more about testing later. You can read some more details, but until the tests get closer, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the mechanics of testing other than to say test drop takes the place of makeups. If, if we did makeups, you wouldn't have the test drop have the test drop instead of makeups. And that's because the math lab puts through, I don't know, 8,000 people during the semester, all these tests, giving all these makeups, it would, it would be almost unmanageable. So instead of makeups, the MTLC does test drops. So if you have to miss test three for whatever reason, then that just becomes your test drop. And keep in mind that's in place of makeups. So we're not taking anything away from you by not giving makeups. We're saying that makeups were one alternative and drops were one alternative. The MTLC chose the drop option instead of the makeup option because it makes so much more sense when you're dealing with that many students. So no makeups, a missed test is a drop. But in any case, read through this more closely. We'll talk about it in much more detail of the testing issues when we get closer to it. This is kind of just a summary. If you want to go back and look at later, it tells you that there aren't any makeups with rare exceptions, like for official university business or military things. Um, there will be some drops. At least three homeworks will be dropped at the end of the semester. There'll be that one test drop that I've already mentioned. There is an option where you can give yourself a, up to a 14-day extension of a deadline on a homework assignment, you can give it to you, give it to yourself. You won't get full credit for the problem though. I'm promoting getting bonus points, so I don't want to promote losing points by being late. But if you have to, you can go into WebAssign. There's a tab called Past Assignments. You click that, find the assignment that's past due, give yourself a 14-day extension, and at least get some points for it. I am definitely not encouraging you to do it that way, but it's there if it, if it comes to between that and getting a zero. Very simple model of your grade, 20% homework, 80% test. In the College of Business, to get credit for that course, you have to have at least a C minus, which is 70% or greater. If you don't get that, you get an NC in the course. It doesn't count against your GPA. However, you still have to take the course again if you want credit for it. Everything I've said here in this video is also available in a PowerPoint in Blackboard. It's also, a lot of the stuff is duplicated and talked about in the official syllabus, which you can get through MyBama and through Blackboard. You can always go back and look at that. And a lot of times, if you have a question about something, you can pull up the PowerPoint for this discussion here or the syllabus and find your own answer quicker than you can email me and wait for me to respond. So that syllabus and this information here is there for a reason. It's there for you to use it. And in a lot of cases, it's faster than trying to send an email and wait for a response. The calculator is very specific. The only calculator you could use in this course for tests is the Casio FX260 Solar. Now over the years, they've changed the way it looks. There's a couple of variations in the model, but the picture of those four calculators are basically an idea of what those acceptable models look like. But the main idea is it has to be a Casio FX260 Solar. Nothing else can be used on the test. As a matter of fact, if you 
are caught taking the test with the wrong calculator, you can be charged with academic misconduct and it can cost you, at the very least, it might cost you getting a zero on that exam. You don't want that to happen, so get the right calculator and practice with the calculator so that when you actually bring it into the test, you know how to use that calculator. This is the only one allowed. It's about $10, I think. You can get it in the superstore, probably get it online, Walmart, pharmacies, CVS, and Walmart, Walgreens probably has it. Get that calculator, get it now, and start using it because it's the only one you can use on the test. I told you I was going to show you some screen captures. This is one of the screens from WebAssign. It's got some links for home, for my assignments, grades, communication, calendar. Go into WebAssign yourself and click around and check out all those links. For example, if you click into my assignments, you might get something that looks sort of like that. This is actually for a trig course, but it doesn't matter. Your assignments are listed. The due dates are listed. You can kind of see all that. Again, I don't want to go over this in detail. I just want you to go into WebAssign and click around and look at all this stuff yourself. If you click into grades, you'll see something like that. You can see your overall grade and how it's broken down between homework and tests. And one thing I will say is that there's something about the way they do this that is not ideal in my opinion, and that is they only update this information once a day. So you might do something and it might not show up until later on in the day in your grade book. But even more significantly in my mind, if you're working a little bit ahead, it will never incorporate a grade into the grade book until the deadline. So if you do an assignment, say, two days before it was due, or even a day before it's due, you will not see that result. You will not see that in your grade book under grades until that assignment is actually due. Don't know why they do it that way, and it's not ideal, but just keep that in mind. So if you're working a little bit ahead, as, as I've suggested that it would be wise for you to do, you will not see that on this page. You will not see the result of that on this page until after that assignment is actually due. A little bit aggravating, but once you know that's the way it works, there's no big deal about it. Here's what you see kind of when you see the, hit the calendar button. It lays out your homework assignments on a calendar. Go into WebAssign, look at this yourself. This View My Class Insights is a neat feature of WebAssign. It keeps up with what you do and sort, sort of tries to look at the things you seem to have struggled on, and you can go in there and, and it will try to push you toward things that you might be having more trouble with and let you know, hey, you might want to look a little more closely at this topic because you've been having trouble with it. You can also look at the actual textbook through WebAssign. Nice feature. I think by now you've gotten the idea that, that everything that's up here now is something that's designed to help you do well in this class. In other words, you need to actually try to learn something. Don't just go through the motions. As you're doing things, you're trying to understand because making a good grade on a homework that you only got a good grade on because you did it seven times is not a good way to do well on the test because if you had to do something seven times on the homework to get it right but you never really understood it, what are the odds that you're going to all of a sudden get it right on the test, which you can't do over and over again? So you're trying not only to get a good grade on the homework, that's important. You're also trying to get the understanding that's going to allow you to transfer what you learned on the homework to the test, which is worth even more than the homework. Anyway, read through that and you'll see it's all common sense. And there are so many resources for your assistance that it's actually probably hard to use it all. But it's on you to take the initiative to ask for help, set yourself up for success. If you're registered with Disability Services, I will get an email and the MTLC will get an email from them and we'll take it from there and do what we normally do. If you're intending to register with Disability Service but haven't, it is not an automatic quick turnaround. So you, if you haven't and want to, you need to do this right away. Contact Office of Disability Services. 
the MTLC really doesn't do anything as far as advising students on how to contact them other than how to contact them because we don't, we're not experts. So you need to talk with them. And then once the Office of Disability Services sends an email to us, then our involvement begins. Again, it's your initiative to get that started. And if you've already done it, at some point soon, I should be getting and the MTLC should be getting an email from the Office of Disability Services. This course allows you to learn a lot and it allows you a lot of room to let you skate and get yourself in trouble. The onus is on you not to do that latter. You need to stay on task, plan, organize, and you're going to find out after a while just being organized and getting things done on schedule is going to start adding points to your course grade. So you know what you need to do. I will say one more thing. Don't use these math websites and apps to do your homework because that is academic misconduct but even if it weren't it's not helping you to learn the material and you certainly can't use those apps or sites during the test because that will be caught and written up as academic misconduct. These websites and apps that are designed to give answers to math problems it's a dead end. Don't do that. Not, not even on the homework. In the long run, you're hurting yourself, not helping yourself. Now to what we really want this course to be about. We're going to cover section 1.6 today, and you'll have a homework assignment too. I will say that this is a calculus course, but a lot of what we do in this course depends on you knowing the basic algebra in the algebra pre-cal classes that you've already had. So. If you look in Blackboard, you'll see that there's a set of material that helps you sort of answer the question for yourself, am I ready to step into calculus with my basic algebra? And if you go through that, you'll see that there's some problems you can try to solve and see if you can. And if you can't, there's solutions. And you can kind of judge on your own, you know, am I, am I ready for the algebra required in this course? And if you're not, you can take some actions before it costs you points on the first test, for example. That's all optional. Nobody's going to force you to do that. But it's something you should want to do to get yourself off to a good start. In WebAssign itself, though, there is something that's required for you to do. There's a diagnostic, I think 10 questions, that you have to do before you can go on further into the course. The WebAssign will not let you keep going until you've done those 10 problems in that diagnostic. And it's not counted as part of your grade because it's really not a part of this course, but we're trying to give you a chance to see where you have deficiencies that might affect your performance later on the course. It's not being punitive, it's trying to help you avoid problems. So if you see a problem in this diagnostic that has to do with what's the domain of this function and you're having trouble with it, that tells you that later on, I don't know, test one, test two, maybe all of these, not knowing that it's going to cost you points on a test or a homework assignment or if it asks a question about you know almost anything if you don't know it it's going to affect your grade so now is the time to see and if you find out early enough and think it's significant enough you can even drop down to a lower level math course i don't think many of you need to do that but there will be a, a few people that might say well you know i really probably need to to go back and get a little bit better foundation in pre-cal first. Again, not most of you, but it's there for red flag purposes. And you can solve most of those things if you're just rusty on something. This gives you a chance to clean the cobwebs out of something you haven't thought about for a long time. So having said that, this topic that we're going to talk about is on continuity. We're going to begin this course with a rather intuitive uh, discussion of the idea of continuity. In math, the term continuous, to a great extent, is the same meaning as we use it in everyday life. Take that to mean that there's no gap in the graph at that point. So if you were to, to draw a graph of something that was continuous at a point C, what you would say is that it has to satisfy two conditions. The graph has to be unbroken at C. There can't be any break in it and it can't have any type of hole, jump, or gaps. In other words, 
point two is really just a description of what unbroken means. It can't be broken at sea, and those breaks can be caused by holes or jumps or gaps at sea. So intuitively, we would say that a graph is continuous if we can sketch it over an interval without lifting the pen in the process of doing that. We would say it's continuous over that interval. So I've just sketched out something here with arrows on each hand, which means it continues in both directions indefinitely. There are no breaks in the graph at all, so the graph could be said to be continuous on the interval from minus infinity to infinity. In other words, the set of real numbers. Any value, and this is the intuitive part, any value where we must lift the pen is a point of discontinuity. So if you're graphing and you have to lift your pen or pencil from the paper to complete the graph, you've found a point of discontinuity. Some simple examples, and you've done things like this in previous algebra courses, there's a discontinuity at 3 because there's a hole in the graph. There's just no value at x equals 3. You have to skip it. There's a hole there. There's no value at 7 because that's a vertical asymptote. To the left of 7, the graph runs down the vertical asymptote. To the right of 7, the graph runs up the vertical asymptote. There is no value at 7. So graphically speaking, you can sort of look at a graph and see these holes are, are uh, discontinuities caused by vertical asymptotes, and those places are, are just blare out at you if you have the graph. So this graph has a discontinuity at 3, and it has a discontinuity at 7. Those two discontinuities are different from each other, and we'll talk about how. Once you accept the fact that the graph does have discontinuities, you can look at the intervals around those discontinuities and say that you still have continuity in the intervals around those values of discontinuity. In other words, if you cut the thread at two places, you have three pieces of thread, and each piece of thread in its own right is continuous. There's no more breaks within each piece. So overall, the function is made up of three pieces that aren't connected to each other, so you have two discontinuities that break the graph into three pieces. But each individual piece itself is continuous on its domain. So I could say that this graph, although it has two discontinuities, is discontinuous at 3, but to the left of 3 is continuous. So from minus infinity until it gets up to 3, there's continuity for that piece. And then between 3 and 7, there's continuity. You can draw that segment of the graph without lifting your pen from the paper. And then again, once you pass 7, from 7 to positive infinity, you have continuity. So the graph as originally pre presented has two discontinuities, 3 and 7. Those two discontinuities split the graph into three segments. Each individual segment on its domain, on its own domain, is continuous. So be thinking that over. It's a simple idea, but you might have to think about it a few times to uh, get it down the way you need to because it's a very simple idea once you understand what, what they're saying there. There are two results that are going to help us through this uh, discussion of continuity that are very important. And they have to do with the continuity of polynomial and rational functions. The first of those deals with polynomial functions and it says that a polynomial function is continuous at every real number. So game over if you can, if you're asked for the, uh, ask about continuity of a polynomial function. You can just automatically say that it's all real numbers and the way you say that with interval notation will be minus infinity to infinity. The other possibility that we'll talk about uh, explicitly is with rational functions. If you have a rational function and that previous graph that I drew with the hole and the vertical asymptote was an example, the rational function is continuous around its discontinuities. In other words, at every number in its domain because those discontinuities are not in the domain of the rational function because they cause division by zero. So the second one basically says, yes, a rational function can have discontinuities, but if you look at the segments around the discontinuities, those segments themselves are continuous on their domains. Let's look at a few examples. All the first few examples are going to be polynomial functions f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 3 is a polynomial. Remember, a polynomial is just uh, numbers times x to positive powers strung together with pluses and minuses, and they can have a constant on the end. Those are polynomials. 
Game over when you do a polynomial. If you see a polynomial, you can automatically say it's going to be continuous for every real number, and you say that in interval notation by writing minus infinity to infinity with parentheses. f of x equals x cubed minus x, same thing. That's a polynomial. That's a polynomial. Game over. It's continuous from minus infinity to infinity. f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 1. Again, that's a polynomial. Game over. It's continuous from minus infinity to infinity. So if you can ever identify the function as being polynomial, you've got the answer. It's always going to be minus infinity to infinity, unless the domain is artificially restricted down from that. And we will see an example of that later on. But in general, unless there is some overarching restriction, it will be minus infinity to infinity. You don't have to graph these things to see what I'm talking about. Even mentally, if you just think of a polynomial function with no gaps. But if you actually see the graphs, you can see, yes, they are continuous. There's no value that's undefined. Or there are no vertical asymptotes involved. So even though you don't have to graph them to, to see that they're continuous on the entire real number line, if you do see the graphs, it sort of confirms your intuition. All three of those functions are continuous from minus infinity to infinity. Now remember, a polynomial function is continuous everywhere. There will never be a hole or a jump or any kind of gap for polynomial functions. But if you come with rational, come to rational functions, on the other hand, that's not always the case. A rational function is a ratio of two polynomials. In other words, one polynomial divided by the other polynomial. And those can have values where the function's not defined. So a rational function is continuous on any segments around any discontinuities you find. And there doesn't have to be a discontinuity just because it's a rational function. But you do have to skip any discontinuities when you're listing the intervals where the function is continuous. And you'll see that in, in some particular examples. A simple way of saying that is that a rational function is continuous at every number in its domain. You don't have to say in the domain of a polynomial, you could, but a rational function often has some discontinuities where, uh, whereas a polynomial function never has any. Look at these examples. Discuss the continuity of these functions. Well, now this is not a polynomial anymore. This is a simple rational function. In fact, this is the simplest rational function, just 1 over x. Going back to our conditions our, uh, for continuity of a polynomial and rational function, this is a rational function. So we know that the rational function is going to be continuous at every number in its domain. So we have to figure out what the domain is. And when you're dividing by x, it's obvious that x can't be 0 because you can't divide by 0. So 0 is not in the domain of the function. And that tells you that you have to leave it out when you're, when you're talking about continuity. I would think of it in terms of a number line. And you think of 0 as being a, a value on the number line. You've got to stay away from 0. So a polynomial function is continuous everywhere, but a rational function can have a discontinuity, and it does, in fact, have a discontinuity here at 0. So you have to skip 0. So you can go from minus infinity up to 0. That's why you need a parenthesis. You go up to 0 but not include it. And then you can pa go past 0 to the right of 0 and go from 0 to infinity. And by using parentheses, you're essentially skipping 0. So this polynomial function over polynomial function, which is a rational function, is continuous on its domain, but zero is not in the domain. So you have to say, well, it's continuous from minus infinity to zero and, and zero to infinity, but you're skipping zero itself. So the function is continuous on its domain, which is minus infinity to zero and zero to infinity. And notice that by using parentheses, you're actually skipping zero. Because zero is not in the domain, you cannot divide by zero. The more you play around with this, the easier this is to see. As with all these others, you don't have to have a graph to understand what's happening. But if you do see the graph, you can see that that value at zero is a vertical asymptote. And you definitely have to pick up your pen to draw the left half and then go to the right half. So there's a discontinuity at zero. But as long as you stay to the left of zero, you don't have to lift your pen to draw just the left half. And as long as you stay to the right of zero, you don't have to lift your pen to draw the right half. So each piece of the function is continuous on its domain. 
the entire overall function, you have to leave out zero. How about this one? f of x equal x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Again, the same conditions apply. This is a rational function, so you know that the rational function will be continuous at every number in its domain. But what is the domain? Before, you couldn't divide by 0 because if you put a 0 in for x, you got division by 0. Here, 1 is the problem. You can't divide by 0. Plugging 1 in for x is what causes you to divide by 0. So this time, you're leaving 1 out of the domain. Picturing it on a number line, you're doing the same thing as you did with the other one, except instead of skipping 0, you're skipping 1. So if you go to the left of 1, from minus infinity to 1, it's a parenthesis, you're skipping one, it's continuous there. And then if you go to the other side of one, from one to infinity, again with parentheses, you're skipping one itself. The function is continuous on those two intervals. The domain is minus infinity to one, union one to infinity. This point is not needed to answer this question, but it will relate to something we're going to do shortly. So I want to take this example just a slight bit further. If you take that numerator x squared minus 1 and realize that that's a difference of two squares, you can factor that as x plus 1 times x minus 1. And once you do that, you see that the x minus 1 in the numerator will factor and it will cancel with the x minus 1 in the denominator. So as long as you don't let x be exactly 1, the original rational function is equivalent to that line y equal 1 plus x, or x plus 1. And again, that is just a straight line with slope 1 and y-intercept 1. Nevertheless, there is a discontinuity at 1 because you cannot divide by 0, and plugging a 1 in here would cause division by 0. So what we say, if a discontinuity can be removed by just a simple factor cancel, it's still a discontinuity, but we call it removable. And I'll show you another way of thinking about it when, it when we see the graph. On the graph, you're having to leave out the value at x equal 1. If you plug back into here and you let x equal 1, you see that y is equal to 2. So it's the point 1 comma 2. So that's why we have to leave it out. There's a hole. And that's another way of thinking about a removal discontinuity. A removal discontinuity graphically is represented by just a hole in the graph. And the idea is it can be removed by filling in the hole. So if I just did that, it would not be a discontinuity anymore. So in that sense, it's a removable discontinuity. The more you play with these ideas, the more they make sense. How about this? f of x equals 1 over the quantity x squared plus 1. Now that's a rational function, and we're used to seeing those have discontinuities, but this is not the case here. It is a polynomial, so it is continuous on its domain, but this domain doesn't have any discontinuities, because there's nothing you can plug in for x and get a zero, and you can, if you think about it a minute, you'll see why. You're squaring a number and then adding one to it. Can you think of a real number you can square, add one to it, and get zero? Well, of course not, because when you square a number, it's either going to be 0 or positive. If you square 0, you get 0. If you square 1, you get positive. If you square negative 1, you get a positive 1. If you square negative 50, you get a positive 2,500. You can't square any real number and get a negative, so when you add 1 to it, it's certainly going to be positive. So there are simply no values that make that domain anything less than minus infinity infinity. In other words, there's no value of x that makes the denominator zero. So thinking about it like this is, it just fills up the whole number line. There's no value that causes a discontinuity. So the function is continuous on minus, the interval from minus infinity to infinity. So it is possible for a rational function to not have a discontinuity. You just have to check it out. Again, you don't need the graph to do the problem, but if you did have the graph, you would see there are no holes no gaps, no vertical asymptotes, nothing like that. It's continuous from minus infinity to infinity. We can now talk about a little bit more technical, the idea of a, of, of a continuity or discontinuity over an interval. An interval could be minus infinity to infinity, but it could be a smaller interval as well. We've already talked about those discontinuities and that there are two types. The removal type we've already discussed a little bit, the non-removable we'll get to shortly, but 
again, the removal type, looking at the graph, you would see a hole in the graph. Looking at the algebraic expression of the function, you would see something that where a factor could cancel out and get rid of the discontinuity. That's the removable type. And we just did that in an example a minute ago, and we found out, remember, that when we factored x squared minus 1, we factored out um, the x minus 1, it canceled with the x minus 1 in the denominator, and we ended up with a, a straight line with a hole in it at x equal 1. And when you plug 1 into that equation of the line, if you plug 1 in here, you end up with 2. So that's why that hole is at the point 1 comma 2. The hole is at 1 comma 2 because when you plug 1 into this function, you get 2 for y. So that's a hole. What about the non-removable type? The prototypical example of a non-removable discontinuity is a vertical asymptote, and you've done those before, the functions that have vertical asymptotes. Uh, f of x equal 1 over x is a perfect example of that. You can see that there's a vertical asymptote at x equal to 0, and you cannot fill in a hole and get rid of that discontinuity. We call that a non-removable discontinuity. In this case, the discontinuity as a, is at the vertical asymptote, which is x equals 0. Let's just do some examples. This problem says to sketch the graph of the function f of x is equal to a function defined by a rule. It's x squared minus 2 as long as x is less than or equal to 0. It's 4x plus 2 when x is bigger than 0. Now, if you think about it, they did the graph for us. We just have to use a process of elimination to figure out what it can't be. Now, what I would probably say is that it's really pretty simple because those graphs of each of those pieces are simple polynomial functions. x squared minus 2 is a parabola, and 4x plus 2 is a straight line. Well, when you say something's less than or equal to 0, that means it's going to the left of 0, and including 0, that's to the left. So what it's saying is, if you look to the left of 0, you're supposed to see a parabola. But if you look at the graphs, those four graphs, the two in the middle, if you look on the left side, this is the left side, you don't have a parabola on the left side. If you look on the left side over here, you don't have a parabola. So just by noticing that one thing, you can already cut your choices from four to two. So now it's just a matter of, is the answer A or is the answer D? The first one or the last one? They're both straight lines. If you look at the second condition, you've got a 4x plus 2. It's a graph with a slope of 4, which means it's going up, so you could probably tell already that it's the fourth one, but you could also just plug in a value. So you could say, okay, I just, I don't want to think about it too much. What would happen if I plugged 1 in for x? Well, if you went up here and plugged 1 in for x, right here, you would get 4 times 1 plus 2 gets 6. Well, which one of these graphs is it? 1, 6 is up here. So it's obviously not that one. 1, 6 is about right there, so it looks like that's the right one. So what I'm getting at is a lot of these graphs that's already done for you, you really don't have to graph them per se. You can just eliminate all but one possibility, and that the what's left has to be the right answer. How about this one? Another function defined by a rule. But it's completely contained between minus 1 and 3. Nothing goes less than minus 1, nothing goes bigger than 3. They're both polynomials, though. 5 minus x is a polynomial function. x squared minus 1 is a polynomial function. So we know from our earlier discussion that polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. So 5 minus x is continuous everywhere. x squared minus 1 is continuous everywhere. The only place... There could be a discontinuity then is where the two pieces connect each other to each other, and that's at x equal 2. So when you see problems like this, all you really have to do, if you notice it, that the rule has pieces that are all polynomials, all you have to do is look at the um, places where the two rules connect to each other. In this case, this is at, it's at x equal 2. And the graph doesn't go from minus infinity to infinity, though, too. It just goes from minus 1 to 3. So you plug 2 into the top piece. The top piece is 5 minus x. When you plug 2 into that, you get 3. Then you go up here and plug 2 into the bottom piece. 
when you do that, you get 4 minus 1 is 3, and they're equal to each other. So that means the graph, the two pieces of the graphs, graphs come together. If those two values are different from each other, there's a gap and there's a discontinuity, in this case at x equal 2. But if the pieces come together and have the same y values, that means that there is no gap, there is no hole, the graphs touch, and there is no point of discontinuity. So the bottom line here is that this function g is continuous on its entire domain, and had they not restricted it to between minus 1 and 3 here, it would be minus infinity to infinity. But because they restricted it to being between minus 1 and 3, you have to stop it. You can't go any further to the left than minus 1. You can't get any, go any further to the right than 3. But between minus 1 and 3, there is no gap. And the reason you know there's no gap is because you get the same y values when you plug in the place where the rule changes. Again, you don't need the graph to see this, but if you did take the time to graph it, you'd see there is no hole or gap. Okay, let's look at this example. Find the constant a such that the function is continuous on the entire real number line. So this time, there's some constant value a which is undetermined, and we want to figure out what a has to be in order for the function to be continuous. And if you think back to the previous example, the thing that made it continuous, and again, both of these are polynomial, both rules are polynomial rules. The thing that made, that you, could use to make sure it's continuous is for the two pieces to come together and you find that by noting that the place where the rule changes which in this case is at 8 if the y values are the same at 8 for both pieces there is no gap there is no hole so all we have to do is plug 8 into the top rule if you plug 8 in here you get 8 cubed that's 8 times 8 times 8 is 512 then you plug 8 into the bottom rule. Remember that a is sitting there, so you've got a times 8 squared. Well, 8 squared is 64. That's 64a. And remember, in order for there to be continuity, when you plug in the two values, they have to be equal. So the condition is 512 has to be equal to 64a. Or saying it a little differently, 64a has to be equal to 512. If you divide both sides by 64, you'll see that a is equal to a. So in order for this original function to be continuous over the entire real number line, a would have to be the number 8. If a were anything but 8, there's going to be a gap, and that will not be a continuous function over the entire real number line. How about this one? You've got a rational function, but the denominator is already factored. At this point, um, we have the graph as well, but you really don't need it. You can see either from the graph or from the original function that if you're looking for discontinuities, all you've got to do is to find out where, if you're looking at the graph, it's where you have to pick up your pen to keep drawing. If you're looking at the function, it's what causes division by zero. If you're looking at the graph, you can see that you're at minus 5 and 5. If you look at the function itself, you can see that if you plug a minus 5 in here, you get a 0. If you plug a 5 in here, you get 0. So either way you look at it, the discontinuities are at minus 5 and 5. And as we talked about earlier, a rational function is continuous on its domain, but you have to figure out once you know there's discontinuities, as long as you stay to the left of minus 5, that's, that piece can be drawn without lifting your pencil from the paper, as long as you stay to the left of minus 5. So from minus infinity to minus 5, you can see you can draw. I didn't exactly overlap because it was so close to the asymptotes, but you can see that you can draw that entire left segment without lifting your pen from the paper. Notice I'm using a union symbol. Technically, when you're writing a domain, you'd put union. WebAssign is not very particular. If you put a comma there, WebAssign's fine with that, too. So one of the things you'll learn in this course is you need to play around with WebAssign and see what you can get away with. If it'll let you do a comma and you'd rather do a comma, do a comma. Continuing, there, there's a piece between minus 5 and 5. And then finally, there's a piece between 5 and infinity. And as I said, WebAssign is not too particular. If you want to put a comma instead of a union symbol, WebAssign is cool with that.